welcome to Chawton House in lockdown. I trust you and your family are in good health. Here we stand in the Great Hall of Chawton House, the oldest part of the building and denotes a sense of medieval pride in the ancestry of the Knight family. And when people first arrive at Chawton House, they usually come because of the connection to Jane Austen. And so if we want to answer that question first, we must say who the Knights are. The Knight family were wealthy landowners in Hampshire, and it was from Thomas and Catherine Knight who were childless relatives of the Austen family that the Austen fortunes took a rise. They were distant cousins of George Austen, and it was from them that he derived the living at Steventon. And whilst Thomas and Catherine were on a honeymoon tour after being married, they visited their Austen relatives and took a liking to Edward Austen. More on him later. But here in the Great Hall, the Knight family and its grandeur is celebrated. You'll notice that there are heraldry and shields throughout. And we call upon that in our stylistic visitor experience choice. Whenever you see one of these heraldic shapes, that denotes an interesting fact. For instance, this rather innocuous piece of wood panelling actually reveals a secret door. It leads into the servant's passage. So, from this side, the family could take their afternoon leisure time in here, and if they ever got a bit chilly, they would just go to the lock store and find that the wood was always replenished without having to come across any servants disturbing their peace. And here is the man himself, Edward Austin, in all his Georgian finery. He is depicted here on his grand tour, which was absolutely necessary for any young gentleman or future squire. And this portrait is on loan to us from the Jane Austen Society very, very generously. Now, I mentioned that he was adopted by uh, childless relatives of his, um, Thomas and Catherine Knight. And here is Thomas Knight up above. And I say he was adopted by the Knights, that's a rather anachronistic term. Uh, they, they more made him their heir when they realised they couldn't have their own issue themselves. And so they brought him up in the style of a gentleman, as you can see from his fine coat and breeches. And in the background of this portrait is depicted the various Greek and Roman allusions implying the type of education he would have had. In this rather remarkable silhouette, the young Edward Austen is being presented by his father, the Reverend George Austen, to Thomas and Catherine Knight. And it depicts the ceremonial handing over of the young lad and his new life and new prospects that he was to face. And what's interesting about Edward is he wasn't the eldest of the Austen boys. He wasn't even necessarily the most intelligent, but he seemed to have a charm and vivacity that Thomas and Catherine liked, and that's why they took to him. And Mrs. Austen, who seemed to have been wise to the potential opportunities, said to her husband once when he didn't want the young Edward to go off and visit the Knights because he thought he ought to work on his studies, she said to her husband, I think we, we ought to let young Edward go to your cousins. And this is Edward Austen's suit. A lot of comments we get is, wasn't he very small? This, we think, was actually from when he was a young adolescent. And it's in remarkable condition and was restored, but there is a slight red mark on it. And that is because it was in storage for many years and was pressed up against another piece of red fabric and that rubbed off onto the silk. I 
I've talked a lot about Edward Austin, and this room, the dining room, really is when we talk about the family, the Austins, who later became the Knights. And one very special object is the one you see before you. This was Edward Austin's dining table. Never mind that it is a feat of engineering, the leaves can make the table larger and smaller. But Jane Austen talks about dining at the great house. She writes in one of her letters, we four sweet brothers and sisters dined at the great house today. So we therefore know that Jane Austen would have sat at this table because she dined and she would have dined at the dining table. And I have seen certain visitors sit at every single place just so that they can categorically say they have sat where Jane Austen once did. Standing here before you in his proud Victorian state is the rather severe looking Edward Knight, son of Edward Austen Knight and nephew to Jane Austen. And he faces his father, Edward, Edward Austen Knight, and we like to highlight to visitors the contrast between a Georgian Regency gentleman and a Victorian gentleman with his mutton chops and um, full bushy moustache. But behind the Victorian severity lies a whiff of scandal. When Edward Knight was a young man, he had an elopement for a marriage which caused quite a ruckus in the family circles. Now, and the girl he married was a respectable lady, in fact, the daughter of a baronet. You might ask yourselves, why is that considered an unsuitable match? He was set to inherit Godmersham and the Chawton Estates. You'd be proud for him to join your family. Well, the reason why it was so scandalous was because his elder sister, Fanny Knight, who was one of Jane Austen's supposed favourite nieces, was married to said baronet, and he ran off with his sister's stepdaughter. No blood relation, but for Victorian sensibilities was rather, rather scandalous. From Edward Knight's portrait is this rather lovely miniature of Fanny Knight, his sister. Now Fanny is important not just because she wrote many letters to Jane Austen and was considered one of her favourite nieces, but Fanny Knight kept a pocketbook which records the relationship between the two Chawton households during this time when Jane Austen was still alive. This rather dashing Regency gentleman is the younger brother of Fanny Knight and is out on display for the first time. He previously hung in the maid sitting room, so now visitors get to see him. His name is George Thomas Knight, and he was actually a professional cricket player. special favourite of the Chawton House staff. His name is Montague George Knight, known affectionately as Monty. And a much of the appearance of Chawton House that we see today is down to him. He was the son of Edward Knight II, and he and his wife Florence really, really loved and cherished the Chawton Manor and Estate. And in 1911, he published a book called Chawton Manor and its owners. And it's much down to this that we know so much about the house and its changes. And he really admired his favorite great aunt's um, literary legacy. And he celebrated that hugely in his work. And in this room, the oak paneling was put in by him because he was fond of the Jacobean history of the house. Unlike his father, who wanted to modernise as much as possible, but when Montague took the reins of leading and hosting the estate, 
he ripped out the sash windows and put in these stone mullioned ones. He enlisted the help of his friend Sir Edwin Lutchens to design certain aspects, for instance the library terrace. And as a silver wedding anniversary to his wife Florence, he put in this oak panelling in here. that we have of Chawton House. It's from the early 18th century and the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that the outer walls are white, they are stuccoed, which was very fashionable at the time. It was not until 1837 that the outer stucco was removed and that was down to Montague Knight. What's like. interesting about this painting is that it shows how the landscape changed from early 18th century to later 18th century. So the gardens are much more formal and regulated, unlike Capability Brown, who brought in a fashion of English landscape that has a naturalistic, wild style to it. The Chawton House that would have been familiar to Jane Austen is depicted here in this painting by Calendar. And unlike the Mellichamp painting, the landscape is uh, much less formal, again done in the style of Capability Brown. And it's easy to see when you look at this painting how the landscape is so prevalent and influenced the works of Jane Austen. Notice that the ha ha is visible here. It separates the livestock from the gardens coming up to Chawton House. And you can see the family is frolicking and playing in the landscape. The ha-ha in Jane Austen's novel is always very interesting. It signifies a sense of boundaries being crossed and on one side is safety, on the other side is danger and the unknown. This is particularly captured in Mansfield Park when Maria Bertram talks about wanting to go into the other side of the ha-ha, whereas Fanny Price is happy to stay in the safety and formality of the gardens and landscapes. We are now in the Oak Room, or what would have been known in Jane Austen's day as the withdrawing room, where ladies would withdraw. It's very much a female space or sphere, which is why we've moved our portraits from the Great Hall up to here to really showcase them to their full potential and light. You'll notice that Mary Robinson, who is my favourite portrait of the house, is much more visible to the eye. Here's Mary Robinson depicted in her most famous role as Perdita from Winter's Tale. The reason why her fame took off so much was because while she was performing on stage as Perdita for The Winter's Tale, amongst the audience was the young Prince of Wales who offered for her to become his mistress. Now it's unfortunate that this is what she's best remembered for, especially when she was such a brilliant writer herself. And in fact, when her new novels came out, people would queue up around the street of the publishers in order to buy her book. She also was a poet, wrote wonderful, wonderful poetry, and she wrote political tracts and treatises. She was a huge admirer of Mary Wollstonecraft, and in fact said in order for women to have the proper equality that they deserved, an army or a legion of Wollstonecrafts needed to rise up. Night family legend, Jane Austen used to enjoy sitting here and read to her nieces and nephews. This room is our newly christened writings room. 
It was once the bedroom of the last squire to live here, Edward Knight III. And as you can see, despite its humble size, it's very comfortable and very cosy. And we thought, what better tribute to our women writers than to name this room the writing room? And we now encourage visitors to write messages for us. Here's one letter written by a visitor. My dearest friends, today I happened upon the most wonderful of houses, Chawton House. I implore all of you who visit today to tell all of your friends to visit at their pleasure. This was dated March 3rd in the year of 2020. And we hope when we reopen again that you may come and leave your own message for us. It's Montague Knight who installed the stained glass heraldry here and he had a huge affection and pride in his family lineage and in this section here you'll see the Thomas Knight handing it over to his son Thomas who then adopted Edward Knight and then it ends with Montague himself. This is the long gallery where during inclement weather ladies would take their exercise if they could not go out of doors. favourite room in the house. Our library collection is superb and absolutely wonderful and unique. We have over 16,000 volumes within our tombs and these are split into three different collections. The first is the Chawton House collection which is the women writers and that's what you mostly see in here on display and these are writers who were contemporary to or preceded Jane Austen. For although we love Jane Austen, we use Jane Austen as a springboard into her fellow writers. We see who influenced her and who she influenced in time. We also have the Knight Family Collection, and this is the library that was at Godmersham Park when Jane Austen was alive. When Edward Knight II sold Godmersham Park, he brought the library collection with him to Chawton House. And then Montague Knight placed his book plates in all of them. When Edward Austen Knight was still squire, but just after Jane Austen had died, they wrote a compendium of all of the library collection. So we have an excellent idea of exactly what books Jane Austen was reading and when. Our third collection is from eminent Austen scholar Deirdre LeVay, who has donated her private and hugely extensive collection. This generous gift is so wonderful and will help to ensure that the next generation of scholars will continue to find important discoveries in feminist literature. The house may be closed to visitors, but as of this week, the gardens are now open. Booking is available online and we would love to see you here to stroll in the gardens as Jane Austen once did.